Hey, what's up? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Simply Pod Logical, a Simply Neological podcast. I'm Ben, and Christine looks very yellow today. You mean banana sexy. Audio only listeners are, are missing out on how yellow Christine is today. I am wearing banana earrings, necklace, gold like lip gloss, uh, gold highlighter, and a yellow hoodie all for ben because it's his birthday yeah this taco Happy tuesday birthday when you're hearing this <laughs> please you. please stop <laughs> christine stop simply's greatest hits <laughs> volume ben i don't think you can sing happy birthday it's still copyright isn't it by who isn't that crazy that there's actually laws? That's why a bunch of famous movies, like they're not singing the traditional happy birthday song. They're singing some like generic Information I didn't know I needed, but thank you. <laughs> anyway, when you're listening to this on Tuesday, yeah, it'll be my birthday. It's, I'm it's 32 Ben's birthday. years old. Everyone wish Ben happy 32-year-old th birthday. Um, yeah, I'm okay. You don't have to do that. The, it, the year 2020 is all yours, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take ownership of that. <laughs> Strange, strange times. But yeah, we thought it would be fun to have a more Ben-centric episode. In other words, it's Ben's birthday. He's going to talk about whatever he wants. <laughs> Which And so what is Ben's favorite thing in the world? Aside from, you know, hanging out with me. It's... <laughs> it's what is it, Christine? Playing video games. <laughs> is it? Well, specifically <laughs> Donkey Kong. And I know you don't really play that much today, but we'll get into that. But it, I'm it's retired a huge, <laughs> from competitive Donkey Kong. It is a huge part of Ben's history that we haven't really talked about in depth before. I, I think I've mentioned it in passing on my channel. I know many years ago, for your birthday, I did a mm. Donkey Kong inspired nail art. Oh, I remember. Do you remember? That. I posted yeah. it on my blog, simplynailogical.com. <laughs> it's, it, it's dead now. Uh, but I did Donkey Kong nails mm -hmm. as a tribute to you. That's right. <laughs> so uh, long ago. <laughs> so yeah, I guess people who have been following a long time or who've ever Googled us exhaustively would know this. But mm. yeah, before I was known as Mr. Nail Logical, <laughs> <laughs> if you were to Google my name, what would have come up is that at one time I was one of the best Donkey Kong players in mm -hmm. the world. Yep. And then you were just under Simply an Illogical Shadow. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> no you I want the know. first search, search result to be the donkey kong <laughs> yeah yeah it's a weird thing to google your so name everyone go seriously. google ben mazueta donkey kong we're gonna get that search result just like above the simply analogical boyfriend one so let's uh, do it that's okay it really does feel like a lifetime ago and it's in preparation for this i was trying to think back to what it was like around that time and it's it's been a bit of a trip so i guess a good place to start is Around the end of high school, when I was just starting university, this movie came out called uh, King of Kong, A Fistful of Quarters. And that movie... It almost sounds like a porno. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That documentary has a lot to do with why Donkey Kong, an arcade game that came out in 1981, became really popular again in uh, around 2008, 2009. Do you want to just explain first to all the people, including myself previously, what is Donkey Kong? Yeah, so Donkey Kong is an arcade game that came out in 1981. Arcade before you were born. Yeah, I was born in '88, so uh, we, neither of us were around for the golden age of arcade mm -hmm. games, as they call it, in the early '80s, before games became about like when we, there were arcades when we were kids that were mostly about like putting in a bunch of quarters and trying to get tickets, and then you could exchange a hundred tickets for like a little bit Dave of five cent candy. Yeah, like Chuck E. Cheese type places, yeah. Midway in Ottawa. But there was like this golden age of arcades before home consoles became really popular where, yeah, the place to play video games was down at your local arcade. You could put in a quarter and play all these really awesome retro games. So in 1981, Donkey Kong came out and it was the it was the game that basically made Nintendo successful in America. It wasn't Mario. Well, here's the thing. So Donkey Kong, you, you play a little a little man who's trying to save a woman from an a man or a monkey. No, you play a person, oh. Jumpman. He later became known as Mario. By the sequel, he's being referred to as Mario. So it is, I guess, technically the first Mario game, but oh. people didn't really know that I thought that the, the monkey time. was just like friends with Mario in the same universe. 
Well, they all exist in the same universe now because <laughs> what, what we have in that game, it really established three characters that have become an important part of Nintendo's roster of characters mm-hmm. in their universe, right? So Jumpman is Mario. In this game, he's saving Pauline, but she basically turned into Princess Peach in later versions, mm-hmm. essentially, right? I think some people always got to save those females. Yeah, I know. (laughs) We need all the men playing video games to save us. It's kind of funny because a lot of people point to Donkey Kong as one of the first games that even sort of had a narrative because it had like a few cutscenes of the monkey taking the woman and running away and like showing you Mario has to go climb the structure to keep getting her. But even like cutscenes in video games weren't really a thing back in 1981. So the game was kind of groundbreaking in a few ways. But yeah, so you had Mario established in that game. He's trying to save Pauline. And then Donkey Kong also became a, a very prominent character. So what kind character. of game is it? It's not a puzzle. It's not a race. It's like, how would you describe it? Yeah, so I think it's an er- early version of like a platforming game. Kind so of like, like jumping the, up levels? Yeah, so the Mario games you probably know and are more familiar Mario with. Kart. where Not Mario, <laughs> Mario Kart, Kart, but just like Super Mario Brothers where you're jumping on things trying to get to the end of the level. Okay. It sort of very roughly follows that same concept. Basically, you're a little guy trying to climb to a top of a structure to save a woman from a big ape. And there's there's different from, stories. From the Donkey Kong? From the Donkey Kong. Okay, now I understand. <laughs> so Donkey Kong, I think basically it was a mistranslation. I think the creator was trying to figure out a way of saying like angry or dumb ape or something. But like the translation they came up with was Donkey Kong. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Something is like jackass, monkey. There's maybe like a King Kong tie in there. Although King oh. Kong tried to sue them at one point and they lost that lawsuit. I think they were trying to sue them for copyright or something. But uh, yeah, so the game is essentially you're a little guy running up the top of the structure. You're jumping over barrels, smashing things with hammers, and you're just trying to save to the lady save from the, lady. the big, mm-hmm. angry, dumb monkey. So is Donkey Kong only played on those classic big arcade games? So because it was so successful in arcades, they, they ported it to home entertainment systems. So the first time I ever played it when I was a kid would have been at home on my Nintendo entertainment system mm-hmm. back in the early 90s, I guess, right? But you prefer the classic arcade version. Well, I remember before this documentary came out that made it popular again, I remember in Donkey Kong 64 for the Nintendo 64, there was a mini game within that game where they made you play the original Donkey Kong. I think the NES version of it briefly. But I remember my friends and I were really into Donkey Kong 64 whenever that came out, when we were like 13 or something. But a lot of them had trouble at that part of the game where you had to play the retro version of the game. And uh, like they would call me over and I would like finish that part of the game for them so they could keep playing like the new 3D version. So I think I always realized I was good at the more retro kind of games i don't know is what that it just is. like a hand skill with the old school equipment like i don't know what it is i think like the same reason it's, I'm a, a, it's a joystick right like it's an old like ball so in the arcade itself yeah you're playing with a joystick and just one button i know because we have button. one of these giant arcade machines we'll, we'll in our get garage to i i bought a donkey kong arcade machine it's been sitting in the garage unplayed for mm-hmm. many years now just taking up space in the garage <laughs> I'm going to pull it out one of these days and uh, get back into it. But uh, yeah, I think like the same reason I'm good at and enjoy drumming also lends itself to like the sort of fast muscle twitch, you know, hand-eye coordination response time that also makes me good at some of these retro games as well. So you're good at old games. I am good at oh, I I bought a PlayStation 4 recently and I realized I am not good at modern video games. Why? Cuz there's just like too too many buttons and too many weapons to choose from. Like You know what it is? It's it's yeah, there's a lot more buttons. It's confusing for this old man. And I almost feel like there's something about them that's just less appealing to me in the sense that they're trying to simulate a reality more. Like Halo. Oh. I don't know what reality that's simple. <laughs> yeah, it's not I just, just the first game Halo. that that's came into it. Did you know what I mean? Like, if I pick up a, a like a, f- a first person shooter now, and there's like a bunch of guns to choose from, it's almost like it's escapism in the sense that like 
it's simulating what it's like to be a soldier and I have to yeah. know how to cycle through 10 different guns. And you have to consider your health and like all these other elements to the game, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not looking at video games as an excuse to like escape wish fulfillment of this living life. someone else's life and the complications that come with that i'm i don't like complicated video games i i like difficult video games but simple video games there's Simpy. a difference between complicated and uh, difficult hmm. so i prefer these older games that it's not a ton of buttons or different paths you have to know or different you know i know i have to use this weapon at this time blah 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 i don't care about that i want a simple game that I can, that is really difficult, and that if I play really well, is difficult to do. Like Sudoku, but game. No, not like <laughs> Sudoku. <laughs> like like Mar like the original Mario Brothers. That's a game like everyone can play. It's super accessible, but if you want to try to beat the whole game in under six minutes, that takes a lot of skill. Even though mm. at the end of the day, you're just going in a few directions and just pressing one button to run and one button to jump. It's a very simple game but it's very difficult to be one of the best people at that game. So why don't you tell us, I know it's it has been a while, but <laughs> as far as the internet is concerned, what does the record say about you and Donkey Kong? I, I don't know, maybe I should, should we Google myself <laughs> on the podcast? No, I, I think we should explain that this documentary is actually really important in the story because- In your story, specifically? Uh, yeah, or the story of the game as well and why all of a sudden in 2008 there's a revival of interest in Donkey Kong which came out in 1981 so this documentary came out around 2006 or 2007 again it's called King of Kong even if you're not interested in video games I would recommend this documentary because it's really the story about the two best Donkey Kong players in the world and one of them is a giant asshole and one of them is this like the, the prototypical runner-up, the guy who can never quite win the prize. He's all, yeah, he's always the runner-up. And it's them in competition to see who is the better Donkey Kong player. It's kind of like that new Netflix series, Tiger King, but less insane and about video game players. <laughs> it is less insane, <laughs> but I, I but appreciate it. But it shows a culture of like something that a lot of people just have no clue of. Like I had no idea about the tiger and lion culture in yeah, Florida. It's the subculture of guys who are still super invested in, in, in games, 80s yeah. arcade games today. And yeah, you're, you're seeing that subculture. Yes, actually, I like that comparison. Yeah. It's not as insane as there's no exotic Joe in the King no of Kong No one's trying to kill universe. each other. Oh, All right, you never know. know. Maybe they didn't we'll catch that, that on tape. <laughs> actually, we should. Here, here's just a few seconds of the trailer for King of Kong. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I play video games. It's the constant drive to be the best at something. When you want your name written into history, you have to pay the price. <laughs> <laughs> and and that guy's like a big deal, right? Yeah, so that's Billy Mitchell. So he's known and wants people to know of him as the best classic arcade gamer mm -hmm. of all time. Is that what a lot of gamers in this realm are after? Like they just want to be number one? Yeah, I think it's a lot of frankly like losers and this is their way of being amazing and great at something and they're their people who probably they don't have a lot of success otherwise in their life but i mean to each their own right but yeah i think the prestige that comes along with it and a lot of these guys i don't want to get ahead of myself but a lot of these guys it turns out were actually faking records and cheating scores people found out mm. years later because they just craved so much the notoriety of being of known being as some one. of the best That's gamers. sad, because yeah. then it's like not a game anymore. Or it's not real. It's, it's more serious than a game. Y yeah. Some <laughs> well, you people play I mean? games like, just for it's fun. It's supposed to be in good fun and in honesty, who has the high score. <laughs> it's supposed to be, but yeah, like with anything, if there's fame that comes along with it, people are going to try to cheat their way to no the top, cheating. right? No cheating. Cheating is bad. <laughs> Anyway, so King of Kong, uh, maybe skip the next two minutes if you're going to actually watch the documentary, because I guess I'll, we'll give a brief synopsis of it. Christine watched it too. We watched it together recently. Yes. What did, what did you think? Did you enjoy it? It? <laughs> it was, it's definitely interesting. I guess I've never really been that into video games, mm -hmm. um, but I am aware of your history oh. as being, at one point you were number eight with highest score i don't know why i remember that specifically obviously that changes depending on who else gets higher scores but years ago i remember looking it up when i was googling you oh and that's what it said is that before we were dating and you were googling me you yeah, found that that's what i found <laughs> he was number eight in the world for donkey kong and i'm like he's a winner <laughs> 
that didn't scare you away. <laughs> no, didn't you give me a copy of this Donkey Kong documentary for, our, for like not our hey, first date, but early on when we were first dating? Yeah, as a gift, I gave uh-huh. you this documentary. But and like, thought, why? Because you're not in the documentary, right? I thought it was just like a funny thing at the time. Like, hey, by the way, like I was I wasn't in the documentary, but like, but I'm close enough. <laughs> I was in oh, like oh yeah that really <laughs> impressed me then. I was in the first wave of players who kind of came onto the scene after King of Kong. But the you documentary must have been played. so young then when you got that eighth world record or whatever. How old were you? This oh, was a I, long time ago. Okay, so this is I guess jumping ahead to like I played it on the computer for a while through emulators, right? And that's also a controversial thing. A lot of people. So the popularity of the game actually has a lot to do with the fact that computers became capable of emulating these old arcade games. So a lot of people Mm -hmm. are just playing them on their their Macs or PCs. I did that for a few years before, because it's hard to get your hands on a Donkey Kong arcade. There aren't a ton of them. They're hard to come by. It's a giant box that weighs like 300 pounds. I had to drive down to Philadelphia and buy it from a really strange guy I found on eBay. (laughs) When you were That was a whole experience. And that was in 2009, I want to say. Because I had actually driven down to Washington, D.C. to visit my cousin. And then on the way back with my brother, uh, we picked up the arcade from some guy in Scranton, Pennsylvania, who I found on the Internet. He sold it to me for only like $300, but it was in pretty rough shape. Uh, But yeah, that's how I got my hands on a Donkey Kong. And then it's if you Google me now and you see that I have a high score associated with it, it's probably because in 2010... I went to Flemington, New Jersey to Richie Knuckles Arcade because he was hosting the first annual Kong Off tournament. Kong Off? That's what it was called? It was called the Kong Kong Off. Off. (laughs) So I showed up to that and I put up a a pretty respectable score there. Which which, which was? I think it was like 800,000, a little over 800,000. And 800,000, just to give a reference category... Um, the top people in that documentary were getting like 800,000 or a million yeah, when we watched so that documentary. I think, yeah, in the documentary, there, that million point threshold was really important. There were At that time, there were like two people in the world who could get a million points mm-hmm. on Donkey Kong. By the time the Kong off was happening, a few more players had come onto the scene. Right. A, a plastic surgeon from New York, I think, actually had the world record at the what? time. Hank Chen, yeah. Oh, he was really good with hand-eye coordination. Exactly. That makes sense. He's actually a really nice guy. And even though I'll say, like, I wasn't really involved in the community online. Like, a lot of these guys would uh, just, like, hang out online all day, streaming each other's gameplay and talking and coming up mm-hmm. with strategies and stuff together. I didn't look at Donkey Kong as like a social thing or a way to make friends on the internet <laughs> so much. I just kind of wanted to get really good at it. And it was almost this thing where I didn't want anyone to know I even did it until I was really, really good at it. Mm. So I wanted to show up to the Kong off. Not have Most anyone of those people know who you didn't are. really know me and just throw down a really good score. <laughs> the issue with that is because of that, I had to register uh, like as a competitor and I had to like even share a machine with another guy there. Yeah. Whereas a lot of these other guys who were more well known just had their own dedicated machine in the yeah. arcade. So what happened when you got your high score? I got my high score and I vanished into the night, never but to be seen again. While you were there, <laughs> did you meet those other top players, like the guys from the documentary? Sure, Billy yeah, Mitchell yeah. Or Steve so I, I had talked a little bit to Hank, the world record holder at the time before, because I had a friend in New York and I would occasionally go down there and that's where he's from. And I had asked him just like, are, are there arcades in New York I could play at when I'm down there? Because at that time I was, I was trying to get my hands on practicing on a machine so I wasn't just playing on an emulator on my computer. Just for my own reference, what stage of life were you at? Was it were, was this in high school or university? Uh, it would uni- university. Like early. So we're university. talking two thousand nine ish. So you're like twenty years old or something like that. Okay. Yeah, we're we're in yeah the middle just, of undergrad. I'm just picturing you driving to like some <laughs> random town <laughs> to go play. I'm driving the to New off. Jersey, driving to New York. Yeah. So I talked to Hank, the world record holder, a bit, and I should. S- I appreciate that guy, and I should thank him in a way because uh, the legitimacy of my sc- I never really submitted scores in any sort of official way. There was actually a pretty rigorous process by which you were supposed to 
record your full gameplay, submit mm. it to Twin Galaxies or some other Get it online accredited. database, have like a referee watch it. I, I never really did that because I just knew myself that I felt comfortable with my scores. I didn't really care about other people's recognition. But I know I can still find, and I recently came across it again on some of these forums, Hank sort of uh, standing up for me in a way and saying, like, my score should be recognized as legitimate because based on the gameplay of mine he's seen, he, he knows it's I was a legitimate player, not someone faking it somehow. Mm. So, like, and at the Kong off, I think that kind of proved that like over the course of two days to show up in a live competition setting and be able to throw up a score that is, you know, ab yeah. above 800,000. Like I scored, I think pretty close to the same thing Billy Mitchell scored that weekend. Wow. So I think a lot of people recognize that. Like, Did yeah, you that's talk good. to Billy Mitchell? I, I observed Billy Mitchell Did a he lot. Ignore you. He very <laughs> much had that aura around him of, I am Jesus. Don't talk to me. Yeah, well, you know what I noticed? I kind of felt sad for him that weekend because it was very clear that it's super important to him mm -hmm. that people think he's amazing. And mm -hmm. it's kind of pathetic. And uh, <laughs> he wasn't playing the best. He wasn't at the top of the leaderboard. And you could tell it was driving him nuts. Like he was getting pretty angry at his machine. Mm -hmm. And then on conversely, I was at the machine right beside uh, Steve Wiebe. Yeah. Who like... Yeah, it's intense and you're getting into it and you're trying to throw up a great score. And I actually got good footage of him getting a kill screen and, and getting a high score at the end of the weekend. But in between games, I remember I like briefly had a conversation with him about basketball because it was like during March Madness and Steve's really into the Huskies. He's, he's really into college basketball. <laughs> so I remember him just like being able to turn a switch and he's just like talking about basketball and how he wishes he could be watching basketball right now. So Steve has a family, right? Like when he was playing these games, he had young kids and a wife. So yeah, Billy and Steve both have families and I'm sure it's caused some stress. And in the documentary King of Kong, it does show how it does put some strain on Steve's home life that he's spending hours in his garage trying to get the world record on a video game while his wife is like, could you just help me raise our kids <laughs> yeah. and make some money? Yeah. And it was even, it's kind of embarrassing. Actually, really. that's a good question. Was anyone making money from participating in these competitions? Like, did you guys have sponsors or something? Uh, there were, <laughs> no one was making money. People are doing oh. this for the love of it. But Richie, the arcade owner, I remember, he's an interesting guy. He's like a former punk musician. Actually, if anyone knows how to get a hold of Richie Knuckles, let me know because I'd love Wait, to buy why? a why? If no, I could you're not get, buying any machines. <laughs> if I could get my hands on the Donkey Kong machine that I actually played on in New Jersey or one of the Donkey Kong machines that were used at the Kong off, I would love to get my hands on that. Where are you going to put keepsake. it? We don't have any room here. We, we, got, we got some room. <laughs> I'd find a place. So yeah, R Richie, if you're listening to this, reach out to me. <laughs> but uh, sorry, what, no one's making money. Richie, I'm sure Richie probably lost money on that. So he was doing it for the love of the game. Even if you got a top score and you were streaming this stuff or putting footage somewhere, the only way you might be making money is once maybe YouTube came along and people were uploading these videos. I maybe? think the Kong off may have had a cash prize. And I remember he got... Uh, like Red Bull to show up and give us like free Red Bull drinks or something. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Okay. It was probably like pretty small scale stuff. I think there was a cash prize for the winner. Okay. But you're right. People aren't making money Just by live streaming. Do you have Donkey to put Kong. like 25 cents in to begin playing? Uh, you can set the machine to free play. But here, here's the beautiful thing about being amazing at these old arcade games, right? Is one quarter can start a game for you that will last like two or three hours if you're uh. really good right so arcade owners worst nightmare are actually these people are who are amazing people, at yeah. games <laughs> yeah because you can just walk and put in a quarter and then you're not giving them any more money actually for... yeah good point because anytime we ever go to an arcade like in new york when we were in brooklyn we randomly went to an arcade ben just goes and plays on an arcade machine he's gone for like an hour and he's been playing the same game <laughs> like and i'm like ben come on let's go there's a there's a arcade slash bar in Brooklyn called Barcade that we try to pop into or I try to pop into when we're down there. We went as a the whole the whole gang went down last time we were at Creator Summit and I think we spent a night mm -hmm. at Barcade. Yeah, that's fun. So no one is making money from playing video games. They're just 
loving it. Although today that is very different. A lot of people make a lot of the, money. There are a lot games. of people online making a lot of money from playing now. games now. But in but, the in the nineties or the early two thousands. It's not even that, right? It's like if you're the best Donkey Kong player in the world, like yeah, maybe your local newspaper is gonna write an article about you. You might get some attention that way, but you're not like making ninja money. <laughs> You know, streaming so on Twitch you, or something like that. So why you eventually stopped competing in for the title of Donkey Kong World Record Holder? So kind of, how did that unfold? Yeah, I mean, I always felt I was really good at the game, but I wasn't one of these guys who wanted to invest the days and days and days of time needed to really be at the top of the score, the, <clears throat> the high score well, list. Well, you were in school, so you were busy. So yeah, I was in university. I also had a job. Uh, I didn't have a ton of a social life at the time. And as that changed and I, you know, started meeting people and dating people and dating you, all of a sudden Donkey Kong became a lot less important <laughs> in my life. Oh, don't blame me. <laughs> I'm, I'm you blaming you for You weren't actively playing Donkey Kong I when know, I met I know. you. But yeah, uh, there was a time where I think I had a legitimate shot at getting the world record. And there came a moment where the world record got to like 1.1 million and then started getting higher and higher where I realized even if I had the skill set to get there it's kind of unfortunate that they became like there are 20 people in the world today probably who, who probably could get the world record if they just put enough time into it mm -hmm. because yeah it's 99% skill but there is that 1% element of luck Right. And actually, yeah. that's probably a little conservative to say it's only one percent because there's a few random elements in the game. When you smash a barrel with your hammer, it can award you 300, 500 or 800 points, for example, oh. that that there is a random element to that. So if you have a barrel board where you get 13 smashes of a barrel, that's a huge difference. If those barrels were giving you 300 points versus 800, the blue barrel or whatever. Hmm. So of all the best players in the world, the people with the world record today are probably the people who were just able to invest the most time into it. And are all the, those world record, wow, world records. <laughs> are, are all those world record holders, how were they proven to have gotten the world record? Well, that's the thing. So after the King of Kong, a big element of that storyline is controversy over the legitimacy of scores. Because you know, Steve has a score invalidated at one point because someone observed a little gummy substance on like his game board and it came from a guy who doesn't like the referee and like you know what i mean like there's a lot of controversy over how scores get approved whereas billy mitchell who is friends with all the guys approving the scores he submits like a fuzzy videotape to an arcade doesn't even show him playing the game and that gave him the world record for the, so there's uh, some corruption time. in this industry interesting <laughs> it's, Ooh, it's tell, a very spill political the tea, thing spill the tea i've got my pac-man mug here spill it <laughs> well yeah so there was a also part of the reason i wasn't submitting official scores is that there was a very rigorous process of what you had to film uh before and after your gameplay to have that score legit recognized as legitimate by twin galaxies or that was basically the organization that maintained the record books was called so I wasn't doing that. I wasn't ending my games, resetting the game, opening up my board, showing the game board, all of that. I, I wasn't too interested in that. Mm. If you could see my gameplay and see that nothing fishy is going on, I felt good enough about that. And I wasn't getting the world record anyway, sure. right? But you're, there was a lot of controversy over some of these scores at a certain time. So some of the top players like Billy Mitchell, who had a world record, yeah, people so. contested it, right? Are, are you aware of this? Actually? Well, it was I, in the documentary. So in the documentary, all you see is that he has a tape get approved for the world record, even though you don't see him play it. And it's a little sketchy how that comes to happen. It's approved very quickly. It doesn't go through the same process it should. But mm -hmm. actually, years later, I, I could link people to some resources if they're actually interested in this. But there is a lot of credible evidence that Billy actually didn't achieve those records legitimately that he so cheated. So what for did them. he do to cheat? Like, or what's the conspiracy? So you I have don't to know for sure, but just what I want to know the deal. So there's, it's really important that you achieve these scores on an actual arcade machine. Mm -hmm. Like some people will argue that there's not a huge difference in gameplay between 
the arcade and playing it on an emulator on the computer. But it's hard to cheat but, on an original arcade machine, yeah, right? Yeah, so it's, it's much, I don't even know how you could cheat on an arcade board itself. But with an emulator, yeah, there's a difference in the controls slightly that I would argue actually makes a keyboard easier than a joystick. But as well, on an emulator, if you screw with the footage, if you splice things together, if you have save states, you could play the game in a way where mm. if you die, you just load the last level and keep going, for example. Oh, so got you'll it. notice okay. in Billy's tape, even the one in the King of Kong documentary, there's no sound on the tape. It's clearly a recording of a recording. And one reason there might not be sound is that at the time, the emulators didn't do a very good job of reproducing the sound accurately. Mm. But someone, like 10 years after the documentary came out, really broke down his footage. And they found that if you stop it frame by frame and watch how the level loads, the way you can see like sort of the level come together in the sequence of like three frames, it looks the way MAME constructs the gameplay rather than the way it comes together on uh, actual arcade What's cabinet. What's MAME constructs the gameplay? So MAME is the uh, computer emulator way of playing the game. Okay. So it is almost so it, certain that like Billy Mitchell yeah. was achieving those scores on MAME where he could have been using save states. And a lot of people have been, even back in Kong off days, I remember yeah. in 2011, there was a lot of talk and a lot of people doubting Billy. And I think seeing at the Kong off him not being able to get great scores live made people question it even more. And people had always been a little suspicious too of the fact that uh, like in one of his world record gameplays, you see him getting a lot of good luck in terms of how many points he's getting from certain barrels or sequences and patterns, some of the random elements. And it's just like either that's like a one in a million chance or he was just reloading the levels in a way where they were going in his favor. So yeah, he's hmm. so since then he has come out and played live and shown that he can get like million point scores. He's still an amazing player. Okay. But his ego was so fragile that I think it is very likely that he cheated on those scores just so he could say he was holding on to the world record. Are you going to get time. sued for this? <laughs> he is a very litigious person, so we should so be careful that this is all what's alleged. What's your disclaimer? What's the disclaimer? <laughs> yeah, what is our disclaimer? I'll call this the lawyer after this. Alleged? We're alleging we no that Billy Mitchell cheated on those stores. There is hey, strong evidence that he did. I don't know shit, okay? I don't <laughs> You're watch not video in this games. game. <laughs> I'm not in this game. Um, I have another question, though. Has there been any, like, sabotage of trying to ruin someone else's game? Yeah, unplugging uh, unplugging machines in the or middle of like, a high score attempt. Is it possible to fuck with someone else's gameplay somehow? Like, can you rig something in the back of the arcade machine? Well, you just you sneak up behind them and you start tickling them. Okay, well, play. <laughs> no, man. I'm, no one would do that. No, I'm... I mean, it would be pretty obvious if you mess with people. I'm I'm sure I've heard it happening though before of things getting accidentally turned off and things. What if of someone that just nature. like drops their coffee all over your the joystick and it goes and just blows up? <laughs> it explodes. <laughs> no, it's funny. No, I don't have any good stories about people Damn completely it. messing with. I was other hoping people. this could be like next level Tiger King, you know, video yeah. game. I you know I do think though one of these days I'm gonna pull pull that arcade machine out of storage and play again it's broken though right uh, it needs some work it needs it some needs work electrical done, yeah. work which has me worried because the last time you tried to work on it didn't it spark yeah <laughs> something like i don't want that in my house it's gonna blow shit up yeah it started smoking at one point yeah, and smelling okay, it's, when i turned it on now i hear this like ping and it starts making weird noises that's why I got to reach out to someone and have them make a completely refurbished one. Because there's something just so beautiful about, just to kind of bring it back to the beginning, the the simplicity but difficulty of these original games is, is such a... I have a lot of nostalgia for it, and I really enjoy it. And it's hard to explain, but like, like you've never played sports, right? Never been to sports. Like, you know when Dance. people talk about being in the zone or being in a flow state... Mm -hmm. Do you know what that means? Or can you relate to that at all? Because I've never felt that more. When than, I'm editing? This is going to maybe sound sad or kind of weird, but in Donkey Kong, I felt like, and I've talked to other players who I think agree with this, that you get into the state of 
this almost like sort of Zen state where you kind of feel like everything is in control. You see where the barrels are coming. You can predict the random movements coming. And it's kind of this beautiful, calming, like euphoria. flow state. There's this euphoric feeling with like feeling drugs, everything's in control. It's like you're on drugs, but it's video games. It's strange. It's like almost like an outer body experience. Like when you're when you're driving a car and you just forget you're driving and then you realize well, Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know how you kind of go on autopilot and you realize yeah. shit, I've been driving the last 2 minutes and I I can't remember what happened. It's almost like that except you're doing something really technically difficult on autopilot. Hmm. That's like kind of the best analogy I can have to explain it cuz you can play this game Donkey Kong, simply put, is a game where you're just trying to run up a structure to get to the end, to get to the finish line. But if you look kind of past that, yeah, you can get to the game as quickly as possible and just try to get as many points that way. But then they realize, the best players in the world realize, including Billy Mitchell in the 80s, that the game actually has an end. The designers of the game didn't want it to have an end. It has something called a kill screen. So you have a certain amount of time to finish a level, and that gets calculated based off how many levels into the game you are. Once you get to the 20 second level, there's actually like an error in how the game calculates your clock for how much time there is to finish the level. And it doesn't give you enough time to finish that 20 second, the first barrel board of the 20 second level. Mm -hmm. So people realize, okay, there's a fine, finite limit on how many boards I have to get a high score. So for a long time, the best players in the world were just the people who could get to the end of the game. So if you, if you can just rush to the kill screen as quickly as possible, you're only going to get like 700,000 points, but you'll reach the kill screen that way and you will have played a very safe, conservative way to get there, for example. But if you really push the game to the limit and do what like only the best people in the world can do, it's you're trying to maximize the amount of time within each level to get as many points as possible. And that involves jumping over the same barrel twice you can control the barrels through very small movements to manipulate whether or not they go down ladders. So whereas someone might just look at the game quickly and at a very superficial level just see barrels falling down a hill and a guy jumping over them, like me and the 30 other people in the world or the 100 other people in the world who are really good at Donkey Kong, are we're like... <laughs> We're like, uh, you know, that scene in The Matrix where like he's like can see the code. Yeah, it's kind of feels like that. It's like you can <laughs> you can make things happen that other people don't understand how you're making them happen. You're or, so passionate uh, about this. <laughs> but it's a and it's an amazing feeling to feel like that in control of, mm -hmm. of that chaos. It's so yeah. have you, you filmed yourself playing Donkey Kong before in order to participate in some of these things? I, I guess I just wanted some legitimacy or to show some of my higher scores. I actually didn't so film much at all. Is there footage? There is a video that you uploaded on YouTube yes. like eight years ago, right? So the, the highest score I uploaded was like 970,000. And that was on pace for maybe in a, a 1 million And you uploaded 000, that to your channel eight I uploaded years ago. the last few minutes of footage of that to YouTube just so so people on those forums at the time would actually have something to point but you're to. not actually like physically you're you're not really in it right because that's not how they're recorded right no I was just recording the gameplay some people will have like yeah. webcams or will just stream on twitch their gameplay now and they might have like an angle of their hands an angle of them and an angle of the gameplay just so like no one is but questioning. where did I see a video was it you in someone else's video like I saw it behind you like you were playing at the arcade so you can find was cl that? clips of the Kong off there of the first Kong off in New Jersey that I went to on YouTube and like whose channel is that what is that? Because it wasn't yours. I don't know whose channel it was. I would play it now, except it's full of like copyright like music, I think. But oh. yeah, if you just Google Kong or if you just type Kong off into YouTube, one of the first results, I'll put a link in the description box. But To see Ben it, playing. <laughs> it does show some of my gameplay. I'm wearing like this like trucker or one up mushroom <laughs> hat. And they actually caught the exact moment I died in my... Uh, Oh. on my high score no it was like a really exciting moment i came close to getting a kill screen live at the con wow live. but uh, that's a big deal right this kill screen yeah because is that how the game programmers design it like the kill screen is basically unattainable or they want to make it attainable only to like a fraction of a percent no so what i was trying to explain before was that it's unintentional the designers didn't realize it but they didn't really test the game to see 
they didn't anticipate people being able to get that far far. in the game so that's why it's called a kill screen because it's like a dead screen it's like the blue screen of death it's literally a screen you cannot survive or pass or although there Mm. were rumors for years that someone had figured out a way of getting past the kill screen so you could keep playing and get a point (laughs) there's all sort of myths about this game the random barrels but yeah if i'll i'll link that video below and and you can watch it because it shows the moment i die and i died at like a really random barrel thing and it's also worth pointing out that when i set that high that score at uh, the kong off i had only owned a donkey kong machine for like four or five months or something so i mm-hmm. most of my experience was on a computer playing with a keyboard and i'd only very recently uh, gotten playing into playing with a joystick yeah so who is the current number one world record holder for donkey kong so yeah, the sad thing is is I don't really know. I know there were basically three guys who were kind of trading world records for a while. And at this point, there's yeah a very small number of people who have clearly established themselves as the best. And they're not Steve Wiebe. They're not Bill Mitchell. Uh, they're not it's Hank It's like Chen. a whole new camp of people. Well, yeah. younger people picking up games. And like Billy Mitchell and Steve Wiebe and all these people are how old now? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they are <laughs> getting like older. They were or... teenagers in the 80s when this game came right, out, right? Exactly. So, yeah, it's, I guess I'm part of the problem too because I mostly came into playing this game because of the documentary. But a lot of people are kind of, it's a little sad that the game has been taken over by this younger generation of people in a way because there was just something so fun about the rivalry between yeah, Why don't Billy the younger generation just stick to their Fortnite? Exactly, you know, <laughs> stick to your games. Let these, you just know, make TikToks. let these <laughs> classic gaming legends have their games. Let the dads in the basement play their Donkey Kong. And, and like I was saying too, so there's a handful of people now who have gotten 1.2 million scores, okay. which a few years ago people thought was just almost like impossible, impossible that you'd have to have a perfect game and now we have a few people and who when they're getting these that. scores it's always on the classic arcade game usually yeah so i mean most people don't really care about mame scores they only care about if you set it on an arcade okay. right that's and like yeah. you said the arcade uh boxes are hard to even find so yeah only a certain number don't of them always have made. opportunity to yeah make to play on an records, original yeah. board yeah but uh but like hmm. i was saying before like I think a lot of it now is that there are like a certain number of people in the world who have the skill set to get a world record, but it really just came down to who are the people who can stay home all day and play days upon days just trying to get that world record pace and get that world record score. Mm -hmm. Not trying to take away from the people who do have the world record now. Clearly, like their skill level is amazing. But they also dedicated a lot of time of their lives. But they only could have been the people who had an incredible amount of time to dedicate to this. And a guy like Steve, you know, maybe he had a lower ceiling than a 1.2 million score, or maybe he just has a family and he has a job and he needs to support his family. So yeah. it just came a time where Did it didn't make sense for him jobs? to continue. I feel like, uh, I think they all have jobs. I don't know. Or I, I'm, were they support? Maybe they just like were born into wealth or, you know, their significant <laughs> other just made money for them. I don't know. Yeah. Well, maybe I could just retire and become like a Donkey Kong player. I don't player. think so, honey. You could keep, keep making you YouTube make your videos. Own money. <laughs> You're going to pay your half. I'm going to take some time off work just to play Donkey Kong. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I I kind of miss it. I might play it and kick it around again. But yeah, the dedication it takes to actually set a world record score at this point is just kind of insane. Have you kept in touch with any of the star players? No, and I, I was never really close to them. If any of them are watching this, they'll probably think it's kind of bizarre because I was they'll definitely like, Who the fuck is this I guy? was an outsider <laughs> in that community. I talked to a few of them a handful of times. Mm-hmm. But you were it, just some kid to them because they were older than you. No, but there the were time, some right? young guys involved. There was this French Canadian kid who was like always taking his shirt off, who was super what? weird. Yeah. Ooh la la. <laughs> Yeah, Vin- excuse me what vincent something there were a couple good canadian kids there there was something weird about that but uh i haven't kept in touch with them i'll occasionally poke around and look at the forums still though and are it, they still actively playing not not so much a have little they bit. moved on to other games or is donkey kong their one true love uh, <laughs> donkey kong I will always up. be the true love but yeah i feel like people have sort of moved on the excitement that came along with the documentary and the Kong offs and everything after that. Once Billy Mitchell kind of got exposed for allegedly, you know, submitting those fraudulent scores, 
I feel like that kind of was a concluding chapter to Donkey Kong being a super popular game. Mm. Like it, it'll always be like it is. It might be the most famous arcade game ever. So there will always be some prestige that comes along with playing that game. But between, you know, the sort of story between Steve and Billy coming to a close and people pushing the world record to a point where it would be incredibly difficult for people to improve it even by a small number of points, it kind of feels like the excitement around it has really died down. And now it's just people who feel like playing and streaming the game for fun rather than this competition to mm-hmm. up other people. Yeah, and if arcade games themselves are just archaic and hard to find, inevitably it's kind of going to die out. Harder and harder. <laughs> but th- this happens in cycles, you know? Like the same way vinyl became really popular mm. in the last five or ten years again with Resurgence people who are really into music. Hipsters. Exactly, you know? Hipsters are... I don't like hipsters because people use that as a pejorative. I, I don't mind hipsters. But it's this vintage. idea that... It's like bringing vintage back. Yeah. Things happen in cycles. Things come back into style. I wouldn't be surprised if one day there's another sort of resurgence in popularity of some of these vintage classic arcade games. We're kind of seeing it now with uh, the games we grew up with in the 90s now. Like, I don't watch a lot of YouTube gaming content because I think most of it is... is garbage to be honest. what like, do you mean like the games that are out there like fortnite it's not the games or... it's it's i don't i don't know what fortnite is just... the kind of gaming content that pewdiepie and markiplier and PewDiePie those guys doesn't make popular, gaming content anymore. i know but i'm talking like, back in like, like like three four years okay. ago right the like kind of minecraft but not Mine- minecraft more recent he's gotten into playing minecraft okay. again but he's actually kind of acting know. more like anyway, I'm, I'm not trying to get into a felix thing exactly here but there was a type of let's play content that him and Mark of Plyer and a few other guys popularized that a was basically a guy in the corner screaming and overreacting to everything while playing video games. Mm-hmm. And there is nothing I'd want to watch less than that. I hate that content. I can't stand it. Well, it's just not for you. But who is it for? Just There's children who people, need stimulation, right? though, right? It's, I, I it's don't like understand. It's like Trim Trim. It's like weird <laughs> and cringy. But, you know, maybe it's not for you. <laughs> and I almost feel like those guys kind of lost their mind making that game. I think Felix has even talked about the fact that yeah. it took a lot out of him. And there was a point at which he hated doing it, but kind of felt like that's what people expected of him. And Markiplier, like, <laughs> Markiplier is a super sweet guy. We've met him a couple times. He's done some amazing charity work and stuff for, uh, for like, Make-A-Wish, I think. Like, he mm-hmm. seems like a genuinely great person. So I'm not trying to say this as in, uh, just attacking him or insulting him. But there was a point at which, like, he was, he would occasionally show up on the trending page posting a video of him basically having, like, a mental breakdown. And it was very strange that he was putting that content out. And I wonder, almost mm-hmm. wonder if that's tied to the fact that he was, you know, putting on this character and screaming, playing video games on the internet. Mm-hmm. I, I just feel like... He, <laughs> I, I hope Markiplier is okay because I saw some pretty alarming stuff from him at one point. But well, that's a- anyway, sad, so but that's not just about being a, a video gamer. That's about being a YouTuber and doing it for so long that you lose your mind. <laughs> it has a lot to do with it. But I, I guess my theory is that playing games and screaming at the camera and that being your thing probably also isn't good for your self concept. Yeah. So that kind of gaming content I have no interest in. in. The only time I watch gaming content on YouTube now is uh, there's this organization. They put on events called like Games Done Quick or like Summer Games Done Quick, where basically they bring together some of the best uh, video game players in the world uh, to to live stream over the course of a few days, them trying to set world records or like speed run certain uh, retro games. And they raise millions and millions of dollars for cancer research. It's actually pretty amazing what those guys are doing. Hmm. And to see people who are just like really excellent in video games, like, yeah, you still get some of the cringy characters of people who are like way too into video games. That happens. But it mostly seems like a pretty cool community of people who just happen to be like amazing at Super Mario Brothers 3 or Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Some of the games I remember growing up on when i was a kid 
So what about you? Would you ever be a video game streamer? You want to get a Twitch channel? <laughs> no, I kind of like the idea of keeping video games more of a... A personal activity? <laughs> yeah, more more of an outlet that I just do selfishly for myself and rather than uh, making that a product for consumption. But so much of our lives ends up on the internet now. So much of our lives are monetized. Yeah, just and I mean that's our choice. In general. We, mm -hmm. I don't mean us. Like I don't oh, feel. Oh, you just mean in our I just culture? mean uh, I meant our like as in YouTubers in general. Oh. So much of a YouTuber's life is monetized, and you can definitely decide to which degree and how much of your life you want to show. Like we only show not that much of our lives. Like our day to day life, you don't really see. Well, at, at use we're monetizing it. I would argue beyond just YouTubers, so much of our lives now are shared online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at least you and. Tana Mojo and Lele Pons are Did making you, money off of it. Why are you putting me in the same group? <laughs> Just some names that come to mind, you know? Okay. But Thanks. you know what I mean? But okay. But to get to the original point, yeah, I, there are some things I just basically want to keep for You want to do your stuff. It's like, yeah, I, I get it. Sometimes I just want to paint my nails and not have to go downstairs in my studio and film it. Yeah. Like I just want to paint it up at my computer while watching Grey's Anatomy. You know? Actually, that's a really interesting parallel because there was a time where, yeah, you felt a lot of pressure to just people wanted to see you paint your nails. And, and they wanted to see me paint my nails and scream at things. <laughs> just like a video game. Just like Markiplier. <laughs> ah! Oh my God, kill shot. Hollow taco. Yeah. See, it's the same. <laughs> so like you rebelled against that and started posting a lot of non-nail nail polish content, right? <laughs> For a while. Yeah, and I feel like, when did you start posting nail art again? Basically when people stopped asking like you to post nail art. <laughs> I'm just like a stubborn kid. Never do what my parents ask of me. Well, we should take advantage of this. Christine will do whatever we ask her ask her not to do. So what are you going to tell me not to do? Uh -oh. Careful. I may just stop I gotta making keep, videos. Got to keep this careful. PG. I want you to retire from YouTube. And I no. want us to never go on vacation. Oh, shut up. <laughs> what about you? If I suggested that maybe you want to play video games soon... And post that tomorrow, would you? Tomorrow? I don't know what you're talking about. What's tomorrow? <laughs> just just another day in the calendar of okay. 2020. I guess we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. I think that's it. You got anything? Do, well, yeah. do you have any like heartfelt thoughts you want to express <laughs> on your past career as a pro Donkey Kong player? Like, you know, I don't, um, I don't think people realize. Everyone's always, you know, simply analogical, whatever, famous Canadian weird nail art girl, and was a child actor. But Ben was a Donkey Kong star. <laughs> he was number <laughs> eight at some, some point. I don't know if eight's right. I don't want people leaving this thinking I was actually like a world record holder or something like that. I was, I was among the best in the world for a brief moment in time. But I was never super invested well, that's all, in really... that's something most people can't say. So about don't anything, undermine guess, yourself. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I'm, I guess I'm proud of it in some ways. Yes, man. <laughs> it it's okay to, to be say. proud of your, your video game accomplishments. Yeah, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm happy I could say that. I was, I was really good at something, even if it was something uh, I think, like you know, it's Kong. good to become really, some, really good at something that you're passionate about that's fun and that isn't just related to your work or what you do for a living, right? A lot of people become good at their jobs because that's like what they do every day. But if you can find a passion project and become really good at it and you know you're doing it just because you enjoy it, I think that's a good lesson yeah. too. Well, don't, be, still... don't be too supportive. Nope. I'm going to start nope. playing Donkey Kong. <laughs> but that Donkey Kong machine has to stay in our garage <laughs> <laughs> because it does not fit I'll play us. in the garage just like Steve Weeby. We don't have any room. Sorry. <laughs> We've done <it. laughs> No, we don't remember it. But I would recommend that documentary. It holds up. We, we watched it recently. I would recommend checking that out. Although people will say that it's not entirely accurate. The filmmakers do take some creative liberties in the interest of putting the story before the factual accuracy mm. of some of the things, I would say. But I think fundamentally it gets the story right that Steve Weeby is a great guy who just keeps coming up short and Billy Mitchell is a prick. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the story is great from that perspective, even if it glosses over some things that actually happened in reality. And part of me wishes we could go back to the simpler times of just Aww, the uh, simply times. Billy and Steve competing for uh, world records, because that was a lot of fun. If they were ever listening or someone showed them this clip, would you have anything to say to Billy or Steve? 
I'd say hi to Steve. Hey, Steve, you're a good guy. That's all I <laughs> hey, hope, Steve, hope you're doing up? well. How are your kids doing? Oh, I hope your kids are good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't want to get sued by Billy Mitchell, so I won't say anything. All right. I think everyone should wish Ben a very happy 32nd birthday in the I'm comments. so old. So you're, you're just so, so old. old. I'm not even 32 yet. <laughs> I won't gonna be, be <laughs> until later this year. <laughs> All birthdays stopped having meaning after, I think, like 25 to me. Because I, I, if you can say, like, I'm in my early 20s, that's one thing. But as soon as you hit 25, I feel like the number kind of stops. Well, I forgot how old you were turning, like, just last week. So, yeah. yeah you thought I was 31. <laughs> like, how old are you? I'm the older man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well we should go enjoy your birthday how about that yeah well, you, you want to play some donkey Kong? I, want, I would like you to bake me a cake we'll see what i can actually do. wait no reverse cycle uh, i don't want you to bake me a beautiful cake thank, full of sprinkles thank and, god uh, i'm glad you didn't ask <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody thanks for tuning in thanks for joining us on this taco tuesday ben's birthday edition <laughs> our apologies to uh, mark applier we were gonna have him on as a guest today <laughs> but we we actually ran out of time sorry about that mm. Yeah, I don't know if he's any good at Donkey Kong, though, so who cares, right? But, uh... <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll see you, you. Next, uh, <laughs> see you next Taco Tuesday. Thanks, Thanks so, so much, much for watching. watching. We'll see y'all later. Bye. Bye.